Well, hello, everybody. And here we are for the next episode of Interview with the Exorcist. My name is John Barnwell, and I'm here with Dr. Douglas Gabriel, my greatest teacher and my greatest pupil. And uh, we're letting the world eavesdrop on a, a 50 some year conversation regarding the path towards spiritual science or anthroposophy, the work of Rudolf Steiner, and how it constellated at this time we're in the period of time where things constellated in the city of Detroit uh, from many and variegated paths. A great many people came together in pursuit of a higher understanding and we had a small circle of people that we humorously referred to ourselves as the Monastic Club. And it was four individuals, Douglas, myself, Brian Lynch, and Robert Thibodeau. And various and sundry other individuals would float in and out of this circle of people. And so this is kind of where we are in the life path of this fascinating story. Douglas, how are you? I'm really good. And I'm so glad you brought that up because I think at some point we need, maybe now, maybe later, to describe the Manasseh Club and what that was about. I'll just say one word about it. Manasseh means spirit self. Steiner's translation would be spirit self. And Manasseh thinking is basically what is called imagination by Rudolf Steiner. It's a moral imagination. It's an imaginal realm where you can contact the angelic beings. And so the reason that there was only four of us in the group is because everybody else felt pretty uncomfortable because we this was not a um, mutual admiration society. The, this was four people coming together to argue the issues of theosophy and anthroposophy and basically try to stay on top of it. And essentially, as we were trying to point out, when you... Um, do the teacher's meditation, you actually create the mood of the threshold and you invite the presence of the angelic realm in. And we actually had meetings where the four of us would do this in front of other people and we would have Gertian conversations, Gertianistic conversations. And there's actually the anthroposophical world is really into this. And they give you kind of some ideas on how to structure it so that you can have a conversation that brings in more intelligence and wisdom than you have individually. And basically, Rudolf Steiner says it's more than one plus one plus one plus one. It, well, it became a collective. And this collective drew a lot of people towards us. And it also repelled a lot of other people because we had some very strange rules. And the rules were, this isn't personal. If you're going to get caught up in your own personal problem because one of the group is telling you that your thought is absolutely incorrect and here's the correct way to think about it, then you're not going to last. As a matter of fact, Thibodeau had uh, quite a few funny ways to say that. He says, you, <laughs> I can't even repeat them uh, because they're so crazy. But basically, it's you put everything on the line when you come to this group. It's like you put your head on the chopping block. And if you say something that's not a monastic thought or leading to monastic thinking, you might get your head chopped, chopped off. Now, there were some women who were part of this group at kind of in and out a little bit. Uh, there was uh, uh, there was Colleen and Sharon and Linda and um, a few others who would, you know, they'd come and they'd constellate, they'd listen to the conversation. But basically, this was almost like going into a, a boxing ring and, and punching it out until because when I met Robert Thibodeau, he had been trained by Nidra Brooks, one of the top theosophists in our area. She led the Theosophical Society here, where you and I and Robert and Brian lectured many times. Matter of fact, they used to have it all on tape. And I went in there one day and I went, whoa, I had no idea we did so many talks here. But I guess we did a lot of talks there. And Nidra Brooks had uh, told Robert some crazy things about anthroposophy. So he would tell me, you know, um, these stories and I'd go, no, 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 that's not right. That's not correct. That didn't happen. Uh, so then I'd have to prove it. And so I got Brian 
and eventually he got you and we'd come together and we'd hammer out all these uh, controversial issues as well as we were building a community. It was truly uh, the Mayflower that the community had, had uh, clustered around before that because it was the place, you know, there wasn't the internet. There wasn't a lot. No, the libraries didn't have these books in them. And if you wanted to study any spiritual path, and they were all here in Detroit, matter of fact, we pointed that out, all the spiritual paths were here, as well as some, some that were here that weren't anywhere else, as a matter of fact. But anyway, uh, later it became really the Manasseh Club was a coordinator, not only for spiritual events, for bringing people in from all over the world, paying them to come and then making sure that they made money while they were here in Detroit through the Mayflower Bookshop. Uh, but eventually it uh, merged with the Anthroposophic Study Group, which uh, myself and others founded in downtown Detroit when the Institute was there in Indian Village. And it merged with the Romantic Futurists, which was a, we mentioned before, an amazing group of people, really artists who were uh, trying to resurrect kind of a, uh, a pseudo romanticism in music and art in uh, philosophy, literature, whatever. So this was an amazing group, this little monastic club. And we really did practice trying to work on what Rudolf Steiner would call intellectual clairvoyance or using his path of initiation and his path of spiritual training, which is taken from basically all the different world traditional uh, world religions and their paths. Rudolf Steiner was able to synthesize all of that, but he also had his direct clairvoyant experience of it. So he could tell you what it looked like. He could characterize it in a way that you yourself could approach it. And this is the difference between most of these Western esoteric paths, which, you know, they may give you the information, but there could be occult blinds, uh, like in, in the Blue Equinox in, in Aleister Crowley's work, he put in some false information so you couldn't complete these uh, rituals, these initiations, these this uh, spiritual development. And this is true really with a lot of groups. The, uh, the limitation of the founder is in the original documents. But when you were looking at Rudolf Steiner, where were his limitations? <laughs> Good luck finding them. And uh, once you've studied the 330 books and you've read all of them a couple times and uh, you're reflecting upon that, you're going to realize that Rudolf Steiner was truly a great master being. There is no doubt about that. And one could even... Um, compare him to Thomas Aquinas or compare him to um, Aristotle or other great thinkers who were significant in their time and uh, that we still live in the shadow of some of these beings. And so we still live in the shadow of anthroposophy, but it was out of the monastic club that we really created uh, a resurgence, a, a basically um, uh, a complete new infusion of young energy into the Anthroposophical Society, not just here in Detroit, but uh, across America. Later, the head of the Anthroposophic Society, the um, headquarters of it moved to Ann Arbor. So right now, still in our area, I live a couple minutes from there. That's the headquarters of the Anthroposophical Society. And uh, it is really true that in this area, all kinds of strange people come. For instance, there was a Greek Orthodox priest. John knows the story. We told it one other time in a long past pod podcast. So Bobby calls us up. Now, this is the way it usually happens. Everybody's trying to feed the Manasa Club information so that we can digest it and then give it back to them and say, well, this is what we think is going on or whatever, just like they use me to to vet certain circumstances that look like possession or obsession and, you know, or manifestations of angels. So we were used all the time for this kind of stuff. So Bobby calls us up and says, uh, you have to come see this icon of St. Fernarius at this Greek Orthodox. I think it's Greek Orthodox church. It was an Orthodox church for sure. And uh, we said, okay, great. So what's the deal with this? He says, oh, on the bulletin board, people have brought their medical records to show that coming and just touching this icon of St. Fernarius healed them and they left their crutches, they left their wheelchairs and all kinds of testimonials in this, in this board. 
And it's this, uh, St. Frenarius was basically a, um, like a Greek Orthodox, there's St. Frenarius, a Greek Orthodox St. George. And he actually has the same story, St. George and the Dragon. St. Frenarius was tortured 12, 13 different ways, died similar death to Longinus, the a Roman centurion who stabbed the side of Christ. All those stories come from Longinus, really, uh, in Eastern Anatolia. But anyway, so I didn't know who St. Frenarius was. And I say to Bobby, okay, so Bobby and John and I, we go off to this place, right? And so we go in this church and uh, it's open because so many people are coming almost as a pilgrimage to come there, but we happen to be there alone. We pass the priest in his office. He says, yeah, go on in. So we went into the sanctuary and we're standing in there and we're praying and this and that. And we're praying um, over uh, the St. Frenarius icon and, you know, touching it because they have it in a display case out there uh, near the altar. Uh, and so uh, we're touching it and I'm not getting anything, but I'm getting a fantastic charge from the rest of the school, the rest of the church. Just like I'm going, this is amazing. But I don't get it. I, I, I don't think it's this icon. So what's the deal? You know. So we go in after we hang out there for a while to talk to the priest, and we're in the priest's office, and we hear the sound of a thousand giant gla pane glass windows exploding and, and breaking. You can hear the glass breaking, and because a, an Orthodox church has these glass in front of these icons and stuff, there's a bunch of glass at the altar behind uh, behind the altar. There's all these pictures of saints in glass. So we all jump up, all, th all four of us, and we all jump up and think, oh my gosh, some, uh, I thought a, a plane had crashed into the building or something. I, it was so loud. It was unbelievable. So we all run into the sanctuary. Nothing. Nothing's happening. Nothing's going on. And uh, the priest is going, well, that's really strange, but there's been a lot of strange things happening here. And Bobby is saying, yeah, I've been here when people were healed and da, da, da. And John's just, you know, looking like John always does, like, okay, what's next? All right. So then the priest goes back in his office and uh, John is walking around. We're trying to feel the energy. Bobby's psychic. Remember, Bobby's psychic. And I'm walking around going, this is too incredible. I have my hands up and I'm, all this energy is coming into me. And I'm at the back of the room with John. I walk up to the front and all of a sudden, Bobby standing right next to me, blue lightning bolt jumps out of another display case into my hand. And I am told that the a piece of Mary's robe, Mother Mary's robe, is in a reliquary inside that thing and I dropped to my knees and I actually 100% believe and I never believed in relics before you know you have to have a relic on the altar of every Catholic church or you can't say mass and so I'm very familiar with relics but uh, so I walk up and look in here and there it is this is a thing about this big and it's a reliquary it looks like a picture frame and there's a number of different um, relics on it and underneath it it says what it is and it's a very fancy one. It's a really amazing one. It looks like a, like an Oregon box, if you remember. It, it was made to be very active. So I'm looking at it, and I'm looking at it, and all of a sudden there it says right there, Mother Mary's robe. And I'm going, and Bobby's going, oh, my God, because he was standing right there. I'm not sure you saw the blue bolt of lightning, but Bobby was there. And uh, it was, I can't say that's ever happened any other time except with crystals when I caused that to happen on purpose. But... This was some kind of message. I think I was like, we were getting ready to say, okay, we don't understand St. Frenarius, don't understand what that sound was. And then we stayed longer and boom, it happened. Later, that man, that priest offered that reliquary to me. Remember, he offered it to me when we were at that church. And later he moved to a different church, which strangely enough, I had a new connection with somebody who was going there. And so I'd see this priest and he'd, every time he'd say, you really should take this. And I'm like, no, I can't, I, I'm not deserving of this. This is, this is a beautiful, unbelievable one. It, on the back, it had been certified by the Vatican, right? So he kept trying to give it to me. And then I didn't go to that church for a while anymore. And then months, months passed. And I think you or Bobby said, 
you know, you should have got that reliquary, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, I think you're right. I'm I'm going to go back and I'm going to get it. Why why shouldn't it stay here in Detroit with all the spiritual cool stuff that goes on here? So I go back to get it. He's gone. He's taken the reliquary with him. No one even knows where he went. How is it that the guy comes out of nowhere, brings this reliquary, causes a furor at two different churches, tons of people are healed. He wants to give away the reliquary, give away this relic, and then just disappears again. That's like a normal thing in uh, 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 that's a normal day in Detroit, right? <laughs> Things like that happen all the time. Yeah, a, a day in the life. Uh, I believe that robe is called the pala. Yeah, the pala. Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, there's so many stories, and we we breezed across this story in another episode, but. We always can come in from a little bit of a different angle, so it doesn't matter if we apparently repeat ourselves. I don't, really, I don't think we're truly capable of repeating ourselves. <laughs> we always come in with a variation. It's more like jazz. But anyways, so in coming into relationship with that, and, and Ariel was around that scene, and, and all these people, uh, coming to this reliquary. Now, the reliquary had, uh, any Catholic church has a relic from the saint that church is dedicated to. And it's, it's put in a container and inserted into the altar. And so any church you go to, it has a piece of bone or a lack of hair or a fingernail or a piece of a robe or some sort of, of physical object to serve as a touchstone. And, uh, but keep in mind that it, many of these were not real. But also keep in mind that that didn't mean that, that it didn't work because the people had their aspirations. And that's good because that kind of ties into the kind of eclectic approach that we had at that time because people are going well geez if you guys you say you're christian and you're going to all these other things what's up with that well it has to do with that um, whole way of looking at things that you have an open set approach to the christian mystery and that in the modern age in which we live people are coming to find that they have their own understanding of what that might mean. And we just try to be respectful of that. Exactly. It's just, um, you know, I've, you've probably heard me say that uh, being born clairvoyant, clairaudient, clairsentient is a curse. It is a, and a very horrible curse, but it's also a blessing and it's a gift if you treat it right. And so I've always treated uh, these things as a gift and I didn't consider it my own. So therefore, when I would run across these things where people would call me up, which still happens to this day, <laughs> it happens all the time. People call me up and say, what do you think about this? What can you help me with this? Can, you know, look at this phenomena. Is this real? Blah, 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 blah. So, you know, it's, I just felt inclined because I was in Detroit and now I had access to everything far beyond the Catholic church. Uh, and particularly because of the Mayflower being such a international center, it's, but it's certainly the the home of English speaking Western esoteric books, but it was, it's a library. People used to come to the Mayflower and just sit and read. They didn't necessarily, Bob used to say, it's a pay as you go initiation. So you buy the book, you do the work and you get the results. And then you come here and you talk to other people who've also gotten results. So that was the kind of thing that was going on. So I felt, that I should, you know, like, for instance, when I lived in Indian Village, I did clearings on lots of houses, and lots of those houses were haunted. <laughs> they were terribly haunted. Uh, and sometimes I could help, sometimes I couldn't. But anyway, I want to describe how we came to be out at Dunscotus. The Waldorf Institute was in Indian Village for um, a number of years, many, many years. And it was... Um, we were out growing. Matter of fact, my friend Charles, who just listened to one of these the other day, and I talked with him on the phone, 
he told me that he too had a direct experience with this, which is interesting. It's almost like the spirit was moving and different people were experiencing it in different ways. So we were in Indian Village and we were using the Detroit Waldorf School for some classrooms, but they didn't have any more space for us. So we were using this real estate place and um, another giant building across the street. And it just wasn't adequate. People didn't want to come to Detroit because it was, you know, they you say Detroit and they think, oh, the riots. Literally, that's what every person would say. I'm uh, where are you from, Detroit? Oh, the riots. I mean, people that got stuck in people's mind. Uh, it, when the Renaissance Center was built downtown, they built it as a fortress for the next set of riots. You know, they brought in the tanks in Detroit, right? So th they were literally building it for war. Okay. And so when you <laughs> say you're in Detroit, they think you must be out of your mind, right? But a lot of amazing, deep spiritual people came here, uh, as we pointed out before, um, after usually a lot of suffering. So anyway, we're in Indian Village and we don't have enough space. And so Werner, my boss, who I was the protege to Werner Gloss, uh, would say, because he knew I was clairvoyant, and he'd say, Douglas, we're looking at a place here or there. And I'd tell him straight up what my impression was, right? He was trying to get a place in, in, uh, in um, Royal Oak. I don't remember which happened first, Royal Oak or Clausen, but both of them fell through. And I had told him both of them are going to fall through. And so I didn't even go to the meetings. I didn't know. They went down to the last vote in Royal Oak. And one person had then found out that the Waldorf Institute teaches karma and reincarnation. <laughs> it doesn't usually go over very well with board members. And so they said, we're not going to, you, you're crazy people. Uh, and, 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 and in Clausen and also... All, all kinds of prejudice was felt towards Waldorf schools and Waldorf teacher training institutes, which the Waldorf Institute was. So anyway, they lost both of those. And I had told Werner, I'm not even going to come to the meetings. You're not going to get these places. And so he kept saying, well, where Douglas, then if, if I'm working with all the best real estate agents, if you, if we can't find them, you find the place. I'm like me find the place. Oh, well, oh, all right, I'll, I'll work on it. So I, I asked my uh, the, the lady who I was the mother's helper to, this doctor, these two doctors, I lived in their mansion, took care of their three children with them, took care of their 14 properties. She was all the time looking for a new place for her uh, school, for special school that she ran. And so she knew the real estate agents very well. So I'm asking her and she says, no, there's nothing available, nothing available. So one day I walk into the bathroom at the Waldorf Institute. And there used to be these, uh, to dry your hands, you had to pull down on a towel thing, you know, and you dry your hands. And, and it was called Steiner. So I always made a joke, a stupid joke about this Steiner machine, right? That's in the bathroom. Can't we take Steiner out of the bathroom? You know, crazy, stupid remarks, right? One day I walk in the bathroom, the Steiner machine is gone. And they've replaced it with one of these blower blowers or something. And I'm going, I turn right around and say, that's it. We're moving. So I go tell Werner, we're moving very soon. And he goes, where are we moving to us? I don't know. I don't know that. I just know we're moving. And he goes, uh, okay, well, that's very nice, but that doesn't help me whatsoever. Um, so I'm delivering uh, the little girl uh, who I took care of in one of the girls I took care of in this home out to a party at Evergreen and Nine Mile. And I'm driving along and I look through the break in these bushes and I see something I'd never seen before. Here is a replica of um, St. Francis of Assisi's monastery, a friggin' replica of it. It's like so beautiful. I can't even believe it. I, it blew my mind. You couldn't see it at all because of all the evergreens. But in one place, there was an opening. And so I look up and I see it and I know exactly what it is because I've been there in Europe and it blows my mind. But what blew my mind worse was I'm standing there with John Barnwell, Robert Thibodeau, Brian Lynch and Howard Weingarten. And we're trying to translate the Latin above this entrance to this beautiful monastery church. 
and 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 I even knew the Latin. It was in my head, and I'm trying to translate it as I'm driving down the road. So I look over there and I see this, and it's like freaked me out. I, I actually ran off the road a little bit and ran back on and then took her to her place and came back and and stopped and took a look at this. And I'm, I walked over there and I'm like, this is the place, Werner. I had no idea. All I knew is that I was saw a picture of the future of us being there doing that. So I went home and I told the lady who uh, was the mother of the child. She says, oh, Dunscotus, it just came up for rent like yesterday. And I went, uh, okay, told Werner, we got the place some months and months and months later. I'm standing at that exact spot with the, those exact friends, and we are trying to translate the Latin. And I go, whoa, <laughs> I'm having like a time uh, temporal distortion experience here because this is what I saw as a vision that brought us to this place. So, again, just another day in, in the life. I have to add to that story because there's another aspect to it that, that dovetails perfectly. And uh, I'm sure I've told the story before, but I'll tell it again because it's beautiful. Uh, Werner Glass is the leading represent, was the leading representative of Waldorf education and, and, and Rudolf Steiner's work in North America. And he considered Douglas Gabriel here to be his protege. Walter was the protege of, of uh, I mean, uh, Werner was a protege of Walter Johannes Stein, who was a, one of the circle of young people around Rudolf Steiner. And uh, Walter Stein is the great Grail researcher and author of ninth century world history in the light of the Holy Grail, of which in a certain regard, cosmological sequel is, is my uh, first book, the Arcana of the Grail Angel. Okay, but that being said, I used to go and have a meal with Werner after we did a course at the at the institute there, the Waldorf Institute. And one day he said he told me this story. He says, Well, you know, I went to Italy and I went to Assisi and and I was looking at this wonderful Renaissance painting, and a Franciscan friar walks up to me and says, are you an anthroposophist? <laughs> and Werner Lake says, uh, yes, how did you know? He said, well, the way you were looking at that painting, he said, come with me. So he takes Werner into the, the secret recesses of the church and he goes into this room and it's uh, like a private library. And in there, they he showed, the, the uh, Franciscan showed him that they had the complete uh, Rudolf Steiner collected edition in German, and they were busy studying it. And so they were all sitting around this table uh, asking uh, Werner questions. And so when Douglas made his discovery uh, of Dunscotus, he took Werner there. When Werner went in, and Werner told me, he said, when I went in, and then I went and, and started checking out the facility. It was like what Douglas said. It was like a replica of Assisi. And he said, and then when they took me in to discuss uh, the rental situation, uh, they took me into this inner room. And it was identical to the room where I had been like uh, asked questions by all the Franciscans at Assisi. He said, that was when I knew for sure this was the right decision. What a beautiful property. St. Anthony's uh, church is there. It's a beautiful, beautiful church. And then everything is there. Even in the basement, they got a bowling alley for the monks. Uh, and it is on a piece of property that is unbelievable. It's one of the um, only two pieces of properties that still have prairie grass growing on it naturally over all these years. All the prairie grass, which used to be very, very, very tall, it became very stunted, and the people would like actually come there to study this. And it had orchards there that had been planted many years before, and um, a creek running through it. But uh, it had all this property, and the reason we wanted the big property was to do biodynamic gardening. So Werner, in his own indomitable way, 
somehow gets Alan Chadwick's top student, Alan York, to come to interview to do biodynamic gardening at Dunscotus once we moved out there. Well, most interesting, he was a French intensive biodynamic gardener, mostly flowers, not food. And so he was Alan Chadwick's top student, but he was not an anthroposophic biodynamic gardener, but he was the hardest working gardener, the most, he was totally in touch with the elemental world completely. I mean, he, and he would make fun of people saying that he was, but he was, trust me, he could see the elementals when it was just he and I around. Cause I traveled that I traveled. Uh, he was, the, I was the first person he talked to when he showed up there, he walks into the bookshop and he goes, is this a cult? <laughs> <laughs> And so, you know, I made friends immediately and I was friends with him until he died just a few years ago. And wherever there was the gigantic biodynamic organic um, projects in America, he was there. He was the consultant. He works for Thompson um, Vitamin Company. I went down and saw him in the Ozarks, my home, uh, and he had built this amazing place. He he helped all the wine uh, makers and uh, grape growers out there in Napa Valley. He, uh, f fruit, all the biodynamic fruit that was being grown in America. That's him. He did all of that. Well, yeah. Uh, Angel Thompson. She was uh, a member of the uh, board for the Aquarian Revelation seminars that were held here every year, along with Robert and Ray Merriman and Jenny Fairchild and all these people from the scene around here. And Angel Thompson, of course, is Thompson, the Thompson Vitamin Company. I remember uh, hearing about that when that happened, that the Angel had, had hired Ellen York to handle their, their garden. But yeah, he was a disciple of Alan Chadwick. And Alan Chadwick did the French and Ted uh, intensive with the raised beds. And the whole garden was huge. and. and all these raised beds. And one time I came in right? and Alan was all the way at the other end with his back to me. He didn't know that I had showed up and I walked and I saw the peas and, it, and I couldn't resist and I picked one and he spun around as if I pulled a hair on his neck. So yeah, he was, he was shall we say, uber sensitive. But I remember going to classes there in the early spring and i come into class and you'd see alan would be outside and he would have uh, a dibble bar well they we used to call it when we plant a street farmer and i planted trees is what that but it's it's this this hoe to, to break the soil up and i was out there doing that and we did this course uh the class with with i it, i think it was with hans gabert might have been Werner that night but he was going with that thing the whole time for the whole, and he had been, he was doing it when we got there and he was still doing it when we left. He just like unbelievable. You know, they say that a medieval farmer uh, it would be in better shape than Olympic athletes. And in watching him, you can understand why. I mean, it's just the, the incredible uh, energy and not to use a machine to do it because everybody else would just be out there with some machine turning the soil. He's out there doing it by hand. And no one could keep up with him. Nobody, nobody, nobody. Uh, one more story about Alan York. Uh, I introduced him to his wife and he was such a sweetheart. And uh, he wasn't young when he came to the Institute, by the way. And he just couldn't understand that uh, a woman would be interested in him. And so I had to literally say, no, no, Alan, look, this is your wife. She goes, this is my wife? Yeah, this is the woman you're going to marry. And he goes, I'm going to marry her? Yeah, because, you know, you would never have that thought. So I'm going to have to think it for you. But she's massively in love with you. She's in love with me? But she's so beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Alan, you know, Alan was like, he was like an elemental being. You know, they're actually a, our younger relatives, these the elemental beings, right? And he was like that. Uh, but when he put this in, there was a giant, giant forest behind this area. And he had all these deers and all kinds of animals, every type of animal came to eat his garden. So uh, for the first year, he put up with it. Second year, he says, you know, Doug, we got to figure this out. What are we going to do? And I said, well, 
what do you usually do? You know, what Steiner says, he says, you got to take the animal, kill them, burn them, and put their ashes around your garden, and they won't come through. He goes, I'm not doing that. He says, oh, okay, well, come up with a better idea. He goes, well, animals are always scared of bigger animals, the animals that eat them. Remember where this goes? And so he says, I got it. I got it. And he wouldn't tell me what it was. Later, I come back and I smell this horrible smell in the garden. And I'm saying, what? this manure is not, uh, this manure smells terrible. You didn't put it through a compost. He goes, I know, this is zoo poo. I said, zoo poo? Why did you get poop from the zoo? He goes, I got the lion poop and the tiger poop. And now no animals come around because they smell that poop and they ain't coming in my garden. And he didn't have to put up any fences. He refused to put up fences because it made the garden look ugly. And he, his garden was so beautiful. It, it was astounding. And so uh, then Hilmar Moore came, a very interesting character, and he started teaching biodynamics with Alan and the two of them continued. But now at about, about the same time, um, Brian had got a house out near the Institute and we would have meetings there and we brought in um, David Spangler. Now I've told you that I've gone to Find I had gone to Findhorn. You knew, you know, the, uh, all these people from Findhorn because they came through. But David Spangler, we didn't know that we could. He's like the leader of the New Age, according to you know Constance Cumby and the person who wrote the horrible book about the New Age. Uh, but he was the guy, the guy. Everybody knew that in the whole world. If you want to say you say New Age, you say David Spangler. And he traveled all over the world because he had left uh, Findhorn. He got some education things going there. Then he left. He traveled all over the world all the time. Very, very busy guy. So he's in Brian's house with us, and we have a group there. I don't remember exactly. There was a few of us, you know, maybe a dozen people. And we would ask him questions. And he wouldn't go into trance, but he would go into a higher state of consciousness. And I would watch this because I'm watching his aura, and I'm going, wow, this guy's the real deal, man. This guy is serious. This I'd seen... <laughs> I'd met so many channelers before, so many people channeling, and most of it is just sheer bunk. Just it's their higher self trying to speak through them, and so they change their voice like Ramtha or whatever. You know, how many of those were out there? Well, the Mayflower had every single one of them, and there must have been, I don't know what, a hundred different channelers in those days. Well, David Spangler never said he channeled anybody, and he wrote some really great books that became very famous. And so he's sitting there, and we ask him this really deep question. And he goes into this condition. He's totally awake, but you know he's not there anymore. He's become completely selfless. He's become a vessel. And then he you can see him. I saw it well. You can see, hear, feel, touch, whatever, talking to an angel. And he didn't get the answer from that angel. So he went to another angel, and that angel asked an archangel. And then he came back with the answer to us. And the answer was blew all of us away. It's like, oh my God, this guy just literally went up into heaven and got the answer for us. And brought, like it was no big deal, right? Because, you know, he does this every day. So we became very, very good friends with him. He did some seminars. And yeah, I'd totally forgotten about those uh, seminars we used to do with Ray Merriman. Those were great. And they were some of the first in the country. And they were one of the, the it was an archetype, actually, of, of those kind of spiritual conferences. But then Spangler would do those. He'd do them with Malenko and uh, Kathy Montanovich and uh, William Irwin Thompson and the whole Lorian group. And so uh, Rupert Sheldrake and all these people. So they would have these conferences and we would go to them. And we became such good friends with uh, Spangler that I would visit him when, he, uh, when I'd go out to Seattle. I'd visit... Um, Kathy and Malenko, they got divorced after a while. And Howard, our dear friend who was the painter, he was, he talked to Malenko every week or two uh, throughout all the rest of that time. We became so good friends with them that, uh, but the whole point, there's a point to this. So we're at this little meeting with David Spangler in Brian's house. And I ask him the question, you know, you go all over the place. I want, I said, so I said, David, where is, where are the really deep students? You know, like you must have ran into the masters, right? Or you surely, because you're like the leader of the new age, surely you ran into the masters, the Maitreya, the, you know, the Kalki Agavatar. And, uh, 
you go to all these spiritual groups. Everybody invites you. I see your your schedule. It's, it's packed all the time. Where are the real deep groups? And I'm sure you remember what he said. <laughs> You're it. <laughs> this is the deepest group. And I'm like, no, 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 David, you didn't understand my question. <laughs> no, I want to know where I should go next to hang out with the really cool, really spiritual people that you hang out with. And he goes, you're it. This group is it. And I'm like, you, that can't possibly be true, right? You know, uh, but anyway, it, it proved out to be exactly that. And then they started inviting us to their Lorian conferences and we started being presenters there and became fast friends with him. But that's just, David Spangler traveled the whole world. So if you don't believe that Detroit was the center, don't believe us. David Spangler said it. Yeah, David, he was he was wonderful. I, I uh, oh, I didn't tell you, I have to give you this little, nice little story, but the, uh, the last episode that we did, I like to go out and sit on the porch and look at at the. I got a nice silver maple up there and there's bushes. And this little bunny rabbit comes and just sits down and he's just sitting there looking at me about three feet away. And he hung out there for about four minutes. And then I went in and did the show. But so I thought, well, that's really nice. It's like an affirmation from nature, you know. But I remember. I, I've told this story, but it's such a cool story. I mean, I used to have this uh, little mannequin elemental being that hung around with me. And my cat used to chase it around and it would fly away as a ball of light. And, you know, I would, one time I was in a hurry trying to find something at my desk and there's books above my desk and I'm looking and I spin around to, to, walk away and I and I see him down there and I stop and I go, whoa. <laughs> and the little guy goes, he, he imitates me, it does it. So that day at, at uh, Brian's, I go to talk to, to David one-on-one, -on -one, you know, and I sit down and the little guy is standing there in front of me, you know, and David looks down at him and he, and he like brushes him away <laughs> and smiles. And, you know, it blew off. And so it was like, uh, it's a nice uh, confirmation when you have uh, a clairvoyant experience with somebody and they have the same experience you do. And so I can attest to that from David Spangler and also from Douglas. I mean, one time I was using a technique that Ariel had, had shared with us where you imagine a golden rose and you a third golden rose and you move it into the heart of the person and then you have oh, let the rose open up and i was doing that with a friend who was going through some challenges and douglas comes sits down next to me takes one look and goes how cool a golden rose <laughs> <laughs> i didn't tell him you know he just he just he looked at it and said, oh, how cool, a golden rose. Well, you know, those people we hung out with, you just mentioned a half a dozen of them who were, they were psychic, you know. They were, you know, like Ariel would heal people with just her hands uh, running uh, colored light through their body. She could work on their aura, you know, she'd do all this stuff. But one of my favorite people that was never a member of the monastic club because he didn't live here, he traveled also all over the world. He, no one that I know has gone around the world three times, except for this person. And uh, he would come to Detroit. He was a healer and he'd carry this little doctor's bag, right? And in this doctor's bag, he had tinctures and he could heal anybody of anything. And to get on his list, to get a healing from him, not possible, not possible. He, he was always booked uh, and whenever he'd come into Detroit, Oh, every few months he'd come in for a few days. 100% booked. Every single speck of his time was uh, completely booked out. But when I met him, I don't remember how I met him. We became fast friends and he took me under his wing and he, he taught me like I was a student, right? And so I would get treatments from him and he'd teach me this stuff. His name was Les, Les Collins. And Les Collins is now probably the top American, I would even put him higher 
than um, uh, Uma Thurman's dad, um, Robert Thurman, uh, uh, in terms of being an American who is teaching Tibetan wisdom here in America, I would say that Les Collins is higher than even him. He's a professor. Uh, but Les is now the uh, lead um, lama at, in the Oakland Center in California. And before that, he was up in Ashland, Oregon. And he's a Nyingma Pa. He's a black hat, not a, like, I, I've, you know, Galupa. I followed the Galupa and the um, Saki and the Kaju. But he introduced me to Nyingma, the, you know, the different hats, the different four. There's actually five groups, if you count Bampo. So Les kept saying, no, you need to get out of this, you know, shallow water with these people that you're doing this stuff with. You need to go into the real stuff, into what's called Zongqin, the quickest form to enlightenment. Very, very, very quick. And uh, he became a master at that. And he also became a master at things like uh, the Tumo practice and these kind of things. Now, Les Collins had traveled all over the world when he was young. He actually... Uh, met the etheric Christ in Afghanistan as he was headed up to the Khyber Pass, and he had an encounter with him there. And so he was fully, completely clairvoyantly aware. It, it was, you know, he wasn't like I was. He, his stuff was always so serious. Oh, my God, he was so serious. You know, you you didn't. He'd either be, you know, having a raucously good time and completely away from it because he also played flute for, he played bass, upright bass, and he played flute. Who do he used to play for? Uh, um, uh, Lou Reed, he used to play, uh, he played bass with <laughs> one time. Less. Oh, and then yeah. he was in Oakland and he played with uh, a jazz, one of the most famous jazz bands. He was the bass player with them. So he'd been, he'd been all over. He'd done everything, right? Everything. This is the most interesting man in the world, okay? And so he's going up into Tibet. He's living, uh, he went to Afghanistan, he went to India, he went to Pakistan, and then he was going up to Tibet. So he goes up there by himself. And they said, no one goes by themselves, plus you're a Westerner. So he disguised himself as a crazy person, right? And everywhere he went, he looked like he was being completely insane, and so that he wouldn't have to speak, so they wouldn't know that he was a Westerner. And he worked his way all the way up, and he's in the Himalayas, and he's getting ready to go over, and, and he's going to go down to Lhasa. This was the only way in those days um, when, the, when the Dalai Lama was still in, in uh, Lhasa. Uh, and so on the path, robbers attack him and put a hatchet in his head. And so they trepan him. In the old days, they used to poke a hole in your head so you'd be more spiritual, right? That's why they get the tonsure on the head so you'd be more spiritual. That's the way they wear the yarmulke. Anyway, he got attacked by robbers who took everything. He was in a tent, and he, so he couldn't defend himself. And they hit him in the head with an ax, and it, it busted open his head, and he almost died. So some people came along and took him the rest of the way and took him to a monastery. And the head of the monastery said, oh, there's no hope for him. Just lay him in front of the altar, and that's where he'll die. So they laid him in front of the altar, and he recovered. And he recovered so much in that he, he learned Tibetan a language uh, fluently, and then he went the rest of the way to L uh, Lhasa, uh, Lhasa, Lhasa, and he met the Dalai Lama and became fast friends with him. And then he met the Karmapa, uh, who was the head of the Black Hats, and became best friends with him. He had pictures that he'd show me from these days because these stories, every you no one has wilder stories than Les Collins. And, uh, he, and he took pictures. So he actually had pictures of this stuff. So he's got a picture of one arm around the Dalai Lama, one arm around the Karmapa. And they're looking at him like, I love you like a son. <laughs> yeah. He, uh, he actually met the, uh, adventure writer uh, Alexandra David Neal, which is like, you know, she was like him. She went into Tibet and to have a woman do it is like totally outrageous. But yeah, he's he's the real, real deal. Uh, in fact, I, I gave him a, a Buddha carved out of carnelian many, many years ago. And I'm sure he probably still has it sitting on his altar. So uh, bless you, Les. It's good to see you, buddy. 
yeah, he uh, he helped so many people here, and he was so funny. One time, one time he was being bothered by the the Chinese uh, uh, like military guys, and they were, uh, you know, and so he grabbed his flute and just started playing like he was insane, and they 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 like backed away from. <laughs> He was crazy, but I idolized him. He was my idol. Oh, I wanted to be so much like Les Collins because I wanted to travel the world and I wanted to do so cool things. But then I hated it because here, after all my studies, I come up against Buddhism. Okay, let's remember when Buddha turned the first wheel, it was 84,000 teachings. He spun the wheel three times. That's how many separate documents that the Buddha has left, whether they were inspired from the spiritual world or whether physically or from his, you know, da, da. so you can't ever get to the bottom of Buddhism, especially Tibetan Buddhism in the Mayflower. It used to be that if you would go to the very back of the store and go up on this platform, there was this the Buddhist section. There must've been what, 10,000 books in there or something. And it is like, I'd go back there and I'd get totally confused. I'd studied Buddhism, you know, when I was doing my PhD in comparative religions, but I didn't know Jack about Buddhism. Uh, I was a Christian and I thought, you know, that what's that matter? And then Steiner says, you have to study Buddhism if you're going to understand Christ. And I'm like, what are you talking about, Steiner? Now you've really messed me up. And Les won't let up on me. He says, I'm not teaching you Tibetan medicine unless you study Tibetan religion and particularly the Nyingmapa tradition. So he would, he had all these tankas, these beautiful, um, they, they roll up, they're like paintings. Uh, their art pieces, and he had some that were so valuable it was ridiculous, and every single speck of it, he could give you the whole story of who that little being up there is, and there's like, you know, lots of beings and lots of complicated symbols, and he'd take me through all of this, and he'd over and over and over again, and then he'd like test me on it, and so every time he'd come in town, I'd get together with him and uh, spend as much time as I possibly could. Every moment I could, I'd spend with him when he was here, and then he lived out in Ashland. I went out and visited him there and stayed for a while and got major initiations there. He lived in one of my favorite places in the whole world, Desert Hot Springs, California. And I visited him there and um, other places. He was in Marin County and then he moved to Oakland. So I visited him wherever he went. And there was always just unbelievable major spiritual Tibetan stuff going on. You know, I mean, it, it was quite extraordinary. So against my will, I was pulled into studying Buddhism. And then later, a very strange thing happened. Um, two ladies uh, named uh, Aura and Sandy brought the, well, I'm just going to say it because they don't like to say it, but it's the truth, brought the Panchen Lama or the voice a aspect of the Panchen Lama to America from India because they'd gone and they'd met him and said, well, come, come to Ann Arbor. And so they brought Gaelic Krimpache to Ann Arbor and they opened up the Jewel Heart Temple. And Robert and I somehow, I don't remember how, we got deeply involved from the day one. Oh, I, I know why, because they were going to open a bookstore to make money to support the temple. So they came to Robert and Robert and I helped uh, Aura and Sandy open up, which is now still a very successful bookstore uh, in Ann Arbor. So we got to know him, uh, Gaelic Rinpoche, when he, there was like six of us in the group. There's uh, the two ladies who brought him, Robert and I, and two other people who'd come up from Ohio. And we'd sit there and he barely understand him, but I could read his mind because uh, the etheric heart comes up and becomes this kind of memory thing up behind the head. And all the Tibetans have this. You look at them and they can be speaking Tibetan, but you will see images in the back in this thing above their head. You can literally look there and the meaning comes to you without even understanding a word that they're saying. So I met Gaelic Krippache, became very close with him. John's very close with him, studied with him for many years, got the Pfizer Guinea initiation. But I also went to Hawaii and got the same initiation from the head of the um, Kaju tradition and the king and queen of the Kadju tradition and the Toku of Vajrayogini, the highest uh, yoga, tantra, ritual, and um, practice that there is in Tibetan Buddhism. 
So I went up the ranks all the time, being a Christian, all the time, always asking them about, well, do you see the theory of Christ? And they explained that, yes, well, they see this being, they don't call it the theory of Christ. So my point here is most of the high Tibetan lamas are clairvoyant, massively clairvoyant, massively. I could tell you a hundred stories of, of meeting these people, meeting these high lamas, meeting these uh, women, men and women, and instantaneously they're reading your mind. They're talking to you about your past incarnation. They all called me the same name, no matter how many I met all over the, uh, wherever, didn't matter. They'd all call me the same name. So good. This first thing they say, so good to see you again. And they call me this name. I go, I never paid any attention to it. I thought, so what? What does this mean? This doesn't mean anything to me because I'm a Christian for heaven's sakes. And uh, so Steiner said, you're supposed to learn the six stages of compassion from the Buddha. So you can learn the seventh stage, which is love from Christ. And that we need to understand Buddha was connected to the incarnation of Christ. And all this stuff, it still didn't ma make any difference to me. I didn't want to become a Buddhist, but I did. And so I went to Hawaii and there met the uh, Nechung Rinpoche, who is the, the, there's only one Nechung Rinpoche, and he reads the elemental life above the sacred lakes in Tibet and sees letters and puts them together. And that's how they know who the next Dalai Lama is going to be or who the next, you know, Toku is going to be. So I met him and did training with him. And then, and then the, all these amazing people came from India and taught this course in Hawaii. So I got that course, came back to Detroit, uh, did that course again with uh, Gaila Krimpache. So Gaila Krimpache was one of the high, he's a, he basically, he's the best friend of the Dalai Lama. He's the teacher of the Dalai Lama. Everybody thinks the Dalai Lama is the highest, but the Panchen Lama, senior and junior tutor, are the teachers of the Dalai Lama in, from incarnation to incarnation. So Gaelic Rinpoche is, um, it's very complicated, but let's just say he's the voice aspect of the Panchen Lama. And he believed in crazy wisdom. So he was always doing, and he completely clairvoyant, he always doing crazy stuff to me, to John. We've to probably told you these stories before. But he came, he learned American, uh, English, he learned English, became an American, would wear a cowboy hat and cowboy boots and just most amazing guy <laughs> you'd ever want to meet. A brilliant, considered to be maybe the most brilliant Tibetan scholar uh, that was alive. He's now passed. And he started the Jewel Heart Temple. So Robert was deep, deep, deep into Jewel Heart Temple and the people who started it and helping them with the bookstore. And so again, I didn't like it, but I was pulled dragging and screaming and kicking into studying Tibetan Buddhism. And um, if you look closely, Vajrayogini basically takes the mysteries of Christianity and repackages them for the Tibetan Buddhists. She carries a cross. She drinks her own blood, eats her own body. I mean, the, the analogies are all found in our books, of course, on the Gospel of Sophia, but you can't end the direct connections where you say, well, what Christianity teaches this and Tibetan Buddhism Vajrayogini teaches this. It's, it's so similar. It's ridiculous. But this is just, again, why did Gaelic Kripache come to Ann Arbor? The top Tibetan teacher in the world, higher than the Dalai Lama. And, and he brought the Dalai Lama to, to Ann Arbor. And uh, we told this story last time when I met the Dalai Lama, he put his head, I'd never met him before. He put his head on my forehead and kept saying like a hundred times, keep teaching the children. He wouldn't let go of me. And then took me out on stage and made me sit on the dais with him. So, uh, you know, I didn't want this. And, um, but it does make me think that maybe that uh, the curse of clairvoyance that I was born with might have accidentally or might have actually been from work I did in the past, perhaps with some spiritual work that might have been connected to the Tibetan Buddhism. I don't know about that. Uh, all I know is that every time I meet a Tibetan, they all know me and I feel like I know them. <laughs> it's a very, very strange thing. Well, part of the riddle is that Christianity really isn't a religion, okay? The religion part of it is that thing that was created by 
human beings uh, to develop some sort of relationship. Largely over time was intellectual. And as Rudolf Steiner said, it was mankind really messed up Christianity with the intellect. And, and so when you, when you start looking at the universality of the mission of Christ and that there's other cultures that have that aspect within their culture, but they don't necessarily realize, like what Douglas said, that, that, that you're approaching the same cosmic being under a different name. And that, that makes really your fundamentalist types queasy. And okay, that, that's fine. I can live with that. But <laughs> you could tell by the quality of uh, a person's being, you know, the old saying is their heart is in the right place. And that's really essentially what we're looking at here. But when, yeah, Sandy, uh, Sandy and Aura were the ones who convinced Gaelic Rinpoche to come to uh, Michigan and uh, the first time I met Gaelic, he grabbed me by the hand and he was walking around this whole room full of people and pulling me behind him. You know, <laughs> I was like, what is this? You know, he wanted me to be one of his, his people in his organization. But, you know, I let I let Douglas do that. I didn't I didn't get intimately involved with the organization, but became very, very good friends with Gaelic Rinpoche. But we like to play chess, you know, and. Uh, he, he's what a wonderful soul, crazy wisdom, still up there. Uh, and uh, that whole scene, it's uh, really a lot of wonderful people. But uh, it's well, you know, this of, is, let's just say one thing this is proof of what we're saying. As my beautiful, brilliant wife said last time, Oh, really? You think you have a place that's been more spiritual than what they're telling you Detroit was back in the old days? Well, then tell <laughs> us. Tell I, us yeah. the name of a place. Zero offers. No one has put, <laughs> left a remark saying, oh, well, here in Madison, Wisconsin, we have blah, blah, blah. No, nobody. Look, I see the TV series now. I'd go back and watch television or give me something else than what's on Netflix. It would be um, the spiritual history of America. And the central place would be the Mayflower. And you and, you know, we'd have a character, for Bob Thibodeau, all y'all would be played. And the different characters that could walk in from Kathleen Kennedy to the Dalai Lama. Oh, it would just make a fascinating series. And it would go on forever and ever. Because really what I see here in looking is that you guys are sharing your spiritual journey with the world. And so many people are just beginning their spiritual journey. And so they can look at you and say, yeah, it may be tough, bumps in the road, but in the end you make it. Absolutely. You know, and keep in mind though, Detroit isn't just what we're describing. For example, my father went to Cast Tech and around the time when he was going to Cast Tech, Andrew uh, Yoda Marshall, was going to cast tech. Oh, that's okay. right. I forgot yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> of of <laughs> Rand Corporation fame. And uh, so that that's that foreign policy strategist. And he served as director of the Office of Net Assessment for the United States State Department. And uh, so there's, there's shadowy figures in the mix too. And I guess it's the intensity. At, at one time, Detroit was a very important city. It was... Uh, uh, a real central figure in the music scene with Motown and with rock and roll. The, all the English bands would come in, they'd fly into Windsor, and then they'd come into Detroit. And usually their first gig in the United States would be at the Grandy Ballroom with my friend Russ Gibb. And so you have all these different uh, cultural types of activities. And you had at that time, there were some of the wealthiest families in America because of the auto industry. And, and, and so it's a, it's a wonderful legacy. I mean, Gibson guitars were, were made up up uh, north of Detroit in, in Michigan. You know, the wonderful Les Paul is, was first created out of wood from Michigan, from the UP. You know, so it's it, there's so many different levels to this onion and we're going to have well, fun exploring well the music scene is a form of spirituality oh absolutely i mean look at the gospel that we have in this area it's just oh amazing. absolutely so yeah 
I'm sorry, in a row. Great no, show. You're today, not guys. It's you're so adding. Good you're, to see you, you're, but I always like to give a little synopsis of what I see after I do. watch a show. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, thank you for moving here so that you'd meet me until you get me That's on the right. <laughs> she, couldn't, she couldn't stay away, you know? Right. And it's funny because uh, Barbara told Douglas, Barbara told you you were going to meet Tyla, if you remember. Oh, yes. And she described her very clearly. And then uh, you magically encountered her. I guess it was through an online dating service or something like that. Is that what it was? Uh, well, no, yes, it was, <laughs> but Douglas did not write up his info. I've been on eHarmony for years. I, I, I didn't find anyone. And so then I read this one and this was very intriguing. <laughs> Former Jesuit wants to meet anthroposophist, right? And that what was written was written by a friend of Douglas's about him. And just that was so captivating. I had to go out and meet him and it was great. <laughs> So there you have it. Yes. The, the cat is out of the but, bag. But we were in the room probably four or five times together. We were both uh, leaders oh, in the charter school movement. Oh, we, like we, we, we probably sat next to each other multiple times. We yes. know certain meetings that we were both there. And I was actually looking for her because I had seen her name. She got so many awards because he told me I had to go on every single day and I hated it. I wasn't going to do it. It was after the divorce. You know, I'm going to take all that out. You gave way too much personal information. So John, could you just do a wrap up right now? Sure. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, and here we are at the, at the, at the end of just one episode of this journey, this fascinating journey with this fascinating individual, Douglas Gabriel. And I want to thank, Tyler Gabriel, Gabriel, the mastermind behind this production, and 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 I want to thank all of you for showing up to uh, to see our little endeavor here, and I and uh, there'll be more to come soon. <laughs>